Hey guys, Corey, Famous Media here at the Black Magic event uh, here in New York City at the Wyndham, and I'm going to be uh, giving an interview. We're going to talk about some of the new cameras that Black Magic are getting ready to release real soon, hopefully real soon. So, first question is, when are we going to see this amazing camera right here? Uh, for sale. So we're, we're really working hard on getting these out the door, obviously. It's uh, important to us to try to get our release dates as close as we can. Obviously, we're getting towards the end of July. We're not going to be shipping these in, in July. Right. Uh, it sounds like we've got most of the software bits done as, I think, a hardware part that we're waiting to come in in the early part of August. But it does sound like if things continue to go as well as they are, we should see units coming off the production line in the end of August-ish time frame. So, you know, hopefully only no more than a month late. I'm not going to be surprised if we see say the 4K version shipping first, we see some of the 4.6K sensors going to the Ursa upgrades, and then later as we roll out in September, we see some of the 4.6K versions of the Ursa Mini. So there'll be a little bit of a rollout throughout that late August, September. Again, if these last couple things that we need to get kind of nailed down, so a little late, but hopefully we're not talking about December or January this year. So just a couple weeks from now. Awesome. Now, another question I'm sure a lot of people are gonna be asking is, How's the dynamic range looking on the camera? Have you had a chance to test it or see it yourself? Yeah, the thing that we're working with right now is, you know, we, we, we know that we have this really cool ability to be able to kind of electronically control whether we want to be in the global shutter or the rolling shutter, and that's what's going to affect that dynamic, ra dynamic range. And okay. there's a much smarter engineer that explained it to me that I said, that sounds great, and I'll never be able to repeat the reasons <laughs> why, but, it, you know, there's this really great capability of being able to say, look, I want to have that rolling shutter and to be at that 15 stops of dynamic range, which obviously is great if I'm doing a core corporate gig or something where I know I'm not going to be flipping this camera all over the place, great to have that option. But then also to be able to basically just go in and flip it to the rolling shutter and then being able to lose about two stops. You know, it's like miles per gallon. You think it's about there, but we'll see what it really ends up being. But it should be around two stops. So to be able to have a 13 stops with the global shutter, one more than our production 4K, you know, that's a great feature to have in and of itself. But then being able to go over to the rolling shutter to be able to do that 15 stops it's going to be great for a lot of people as well. Awesome. Now, also, as far as uh, using different batteries, pretty much any V-mount or Anton Bauer will work. Yeah, the thing is with the, both the Ursa and the Ursa Mini, we have our own Molex that's kind of specific for us. So you're going to want to go out and buy an Ursa V-mount battery plate or an Ursa gold mount battery plate. If you just take your battery plate that you've had for years and years, the Molex connector won't won't fit there. It's a 14 cents part, but it's a pain in the butt to do. Do yourself a favor, go and find the Ursa V mount or the Ursa Gold mount to use with these cameras. Awesome. And what's your thoughts on the new uh, viewfinder from Blackmagic? Yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful screen in there. It's got the full HD resolution. It's nice and bright. And it's got a ton of menu settings in there to be able to do things like black and white and false color, your zebras and your peaking. So it is a it is a really high-functioning, great quality EVF on there. Of course, you don't need to use it. You could use the screen. You could use other EVFs that you have. But we've had the need for it with our original Ursa camera. So right. it's great to be able to get this product out there for people. I do like the fact that it's got the motion sensor under it so when you pull away it will turn off when you come towards it it will turn back on helps with the battery drain so a really great EVF that I think that if people don't already have one it's a great option for them to consider Awesome. now I know this is gonna be another question uh, a lot of people are gonna be asking is how is the internal uh, preamps for the XLR yeah we've done a lot of we've done a lot of work with the audio on this camera and obviously we haven't been able to do a lot of testing with the pre-production model but in talking to the engineers and the product manager about this about the audio features in here, they have done extra work to be able to have, uh, the, you know, into the audio side with the preamps. You know, we do have the two XLRs on top. I know everyone asks us because there's no way to see it on the website because most of the shots are from. So a lot of people come and they want to see where those XLRs uh, are at. And they've done more work with the actual onboard recorder. You know, there's a much bigger, wider mic on the front that you're going to see up there. It's going to be able to pick up more sound and more audio kind of quality throughout the product. So, uh, you know, we are hoping when we see the final production units with all the audio enabled that we're going to see some real great, you know, preamp work done there. That is pretty awesome. It also comes in PL and EF mount. Yeah, so the big trick with this camera that does take a little bit of explaining is like there's essentially four models of the camera. There's an EF version and a PL version, and then we have the 4K version and the 4.6K version. This is the big differentiator between the bigger Ursa, which is obviously bigger, can deal with heat better, but that's an interchangeable or upgradable really right. lens mount. So if you had bought that camera a year ago and you had the 4K EF version, you know, 
in a couple months from now, you may say, look, I want to upgrade to that 4.6K PL version, or 4.6K EF version. This camera is the camera you get, like with most cameras. I buy the 4K version EF, that's it, that's the camera. You want to buy the 4.6K EF version, it's a $2,000 Delta, but you get that extra global rolling shutter option, um, the more dynamic range, so, and of course, slightly more resolution if you're doing VFX work or whatnot. Cute, I don't know that that's why people are necessarily going to buy it, but you do have to know which model of these cameras you do want to buy. Awesome, awesome. Now, what are your thoughts about the heating with the handle on the top? The handle won't really slow down the, the heating. It shouldn't at all. There's a lot of vents that are that are put up here, and there's the same kind of heating system we were using on an Ursa. It's just a tighter body in there, so that's why we don't do as high a frame rate on the Ursa Mini as we do on the Ursa. So when you look at the specs and you say, like, well, why does the Ursa do so much more? It is a heating issue, but as far as having the handle or accessories on here, this should be able to dissipate and move that heat, no problem. That sounds pretty good. This is this is actually a question that a lot of people are going to ask. So I'm going to I'm going to ask you, even though I don't know if I'm going to be able to get an answer out of you on this sure one. Enough. But the uh, the low light capabilities, which a lot of people are going to ask about, even though this is a, a gamma curve that you're only increasing yeah. and not actual true ISO, uh, how is the performance on the noise floor in comparison to say the production camera? Yeah, I mean it, it definitely seems like so far from what we've seen with the images that we've gotten out of the unit that it is going to be a better low light performer. You know, I'm still a little loath to ever call any of these cinema cameras low right. light cameras. Yeah because we're not boosting, we're not adjusting anything, but you know, the fact that it has the native 800 ASA, the fact that it does have the extra dynamic range is probably going to give you more capabilities in low light. Again, I don't really want to go out and say, yeah. it's a low light camera, but um, you know, when you compare it to the production 4K, this would fall more like I would expect with like our cinema camera that has the 13 stops of dynamic range and the native 800 ASA, so more in that ballpark. So it's safe to say we're kind of in the ballpark of having more resolution than the production camera, of course, with the same lines of maybe the cinema camera for low light, which were great, to be honest, a little more than we even needed because you're supposed to be lighting with these cameras. So from what you're saying, this is this is just going to be the all-around benefactor right here for you know, black magic cameras. It's very difficult when, you know, there's lots of tough questions that always get asked, but when people say, like, well, which camera should I get? Well, you know, it's, it's hard for me to say, well, the 4.6K EF is the camera you should get because, well, it kind of is the best of all worlds. Right. Now, does everyone have $5,000 to spend on the camera, or is it better to get a pocket camera for a particular event or thing that they would do? So there's there's no right answer there, and some people may have strong feelings about, but as far as what you're getting dollar for performance-wise, with the exception of the upgradability of the camera, which is something that you may want to look at the full-size Ursa, but the fact that this could be very easily run and gun, this could be put on a tripod, you know, it's heavy enough to be sturdy, but light enough to be carried around all day. The uh, four point 6K sensor, all the things that is giving you, it, you know, it's hard for not me to start with that recommendation and then work from there, you know, up or down based off of someone's need. Because, you know, the great part about these cameras are they are relatively affordable. So we have students that come and ask us. We have filmmakers, 40-year veterans. You know, we have broadcasters. You know, these cameras fit in such a wide range of application that there's not a right answer right. for everybody. Right. So, so this camera is going to, you know, look and feel similar to an Ursa. The menus, you're going to have the different, uh, you know, like peaking and audio bars are going to be all on the screen. Very similar, just smaller, more compact. Yeah, exactly. This is the real, the big difference is the fact that the size of the camera is smaller, which does mean you're sacrificing some of that higher frame rate capability, and it's not upgradable. But as far as usability, functionality, you're still using the CFast 2 cards. As we do various updates to, like an Ursa menu system, that should kind of translate into the Ursa Mini or vice versa. So. If you've used an Ursa, moving to an Ursa Mini is going to feel basically like you just put it in the wash and it came out a bit smaller. Um, if you've come from our production camera or our other cameras, much of the menu system looks and feels the same there as well. You're just dealing with now a you know more full size but compact camera. So we're going to be getting 60 frames uh, in 4K or 4.6K, a ro uh, rolling shutter. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, the, the, the rolling global shutter is just really going to affect, I believe, the dynamic range, the, the theory in there. But you should be able to get 60 frames of Ultra HD uh, with the 4.6K sensor. So, you know, should be exciting for people to be able to go out and use, do a bit of slow-mo work with it. You'll get more... Uh, more frames per second when you do an HD mode. So if someone you know really wants to go into a slow mo but can live with the well, you know an HD version or, or HD setting, then that would be fine for them as well. 
I also noticed that you guys have also implemented uh, ProRes 444. Yeah, we continue to add more and more ProRes. If you remember, a couple years ago we came out, we had like one ProRes HQ422. Now there's five or six different ProRes settings in there, and as we can continue to add more supports for codecs, more ProRes codecs, or maybe even other codecs in the future, obviously it's something we, you know, we have an endless amount of ideas that we have and are given to us by, you know, our customers. It always comes down to engineering time, QA time. That's what ends up, you know, if you put 20 different codecs in here, all of those have to be tested, all of those have to be certified. So that becomes a bit of a bear when you're trying to release a product or update a product. So we have to weigh that out all the time. As a camera guy, and I'm sure I could speak for a lot of people that use cameras like this, that's a good thing to have. Extra dynamic range, going to be slightly better for the noise floor, it seems like. The CFast cards are a better option uh, because they're smaller. So easier, you can store more of them. They are getting more uh, affordable every week. You guys have implemented a shoulder mount, an uh, electronic viewfinder, a handle, better cooling option for rolling shutter, global shutter. Everything seems like it's picture perfect. Yeah, we're coming along. I mean, we have to keep in mind that we've been a camera manufacturer for roughly three and a half years. So, you know, there's a little bit of trial by fire. We have learned a lot ourselves. And of course, we've taken a lot from the community as far as their own feedback. So I know there's lots of other requests out there. So we are listening. Don't think that we're not. But, you know, we, we definitely continue to build products based off of customer feedback and you know this is kind of a you know a great kind of mishmash of what we've learned over that three and a half year period. Blackmagic does actually have some of the best customer service. I, I can definitely say you guys Thanks. do definitely listen. Uh, it's the truth because a lot of people said that you know they were getting worried about no you know peaking meters and sure. their, their histogram wasn't there but I, I told a lot of people it's going to come eventually it, it will be there and it was you guys updated everything yeah. we've done a number of updates for the cameras and it's very hard to be able to go out and explain our company culture because you know we are a unique animal in this kind of kingdom you know we're not a uh, you know we're not a camera manufacturer that have been doing this for a hundred years we're not a software company that just makes software and relies on software for revenue. So we are afforded some luxuries in the fact that we can have a free version of Resolve and we can include Resolve with this and we can have a free version of Fusion. Um, you know, these are unique things that we're able to do that other companies are not. At the same time, Honestly, we're just a bunch of guys that are making products that we want to have for ourselves. So, you know, sometimes that becomes a, you know, there become pet projects, there become things that get shifted around, but it's basically a number of us just making those decisions, which is great because it allows us a lot of freedom to say, you know, when we make a camera and say like, how do we make the best thousand dollar cinema camera? You know, there's not a lot of companies out there that work that way. They start with the, how much can I charge for this product? And we kind of take a much different That's approach. We, we take a much different approach as users and as customers ourselves to say, you know, how great can we make this product? And how can I, how can I make that so great that a 50 year filmmaker wants to use it, but a, but a first year film student can actually go and buy and use this product. And that's a very difficult task to try to, you know, to try to meet both ends of that spectrum. But um, it, it does make our own company and philosophy kind of unique in our industry. Awesome. Could you maybe give us a little demonstration? Just you know, show us a little bit how it works and sure. go over a couple of things. You know, a lot of this is going to look and feel like a regular regular Ursa here with a you know a menu driven system with its touch screen. You know, these menu systems are all going to look like the things that we've seen before. Uh, you know, similar buttons. You know, this is the PL version, so I, I don't get to do my f stop adjustments with my fast forwards uh, that we've done them before. But this is all going to look you know very uh, very familiar. Uh, as far as being able to, you know, another one of those updates, being able to add the formatting, the cards internally, which was added in here, um, changing your SDI uh, yes. guides in here. But all, but all of these menu settings are, you know, very similar to what we've seen before. You know, being able to adjust that project frame rate and sensor frame rate, that was that really kind of neat way we handled being able to do slow-mo. So you do the, I want to do 60 frames over a 24 frame project. That way when I play it back, it plays it back in slow-mo. So really cool settings in there. You know, obviously our CFast card settings in here so that we can either do the contiguous recording or if we're doing the high frame rate recording, we'll go across the two cards there as well. Um, everything else is kind of the physical bits. We showed you the XLRs on there. You know, we do get asked a lot about what you get when you buy the camera. So when you buy the camera, you get the block and you get the handle up on here. And that's what you buy with the camera. This, the, the, the plates are an option you can buy from everywhere. The shoulder kit, which has the quick release on there, the uh, extended arm and the top handle are all part of a 395 uh, upgrade kit, the shoulder kit. 
and then just dirt cheap, really. Which is really, I mean, and I know the number of people have said, look, we'd like to have this, we'd like to have that. I am sure there will be a number of third-party guys that will make lots of different upgrades and accessories for this. So we may do some of that, but I assume that a lot of guys are going to make those bits. And then the EVF is obviously the, you know, the big $1,500 upgrade that, you know, some people may want, some people may may never need but that's that's an option as well so you know when you when you feel this camera you know it is obviously smaller and lighter than the than the full ursa but you know this is still a you probably kitted out like this 11 maybe maybe 11 12 pounds it's not light you know it is it is lighter but it is not you it's, know it seems to be about the same weight as say a red epic so you're, 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 which is not really that heavy considering the Ursa was like 16 pounds, not, 18 well, when pounds? You, when you kit it out, it's 22, 23 pounds by the time you put everything on it. And so this is fully kitted out at, let's say, 11 pounds. Yeah. It just, it's deceptive because when people, when we talk to people, they say, oh, I saw it online. It looks so small. Then they come and they put it, they pick it up and they go like, oh, that actually has weight to it. It now, does. Now, weight's not a bad thing if it's balanced correctly. And when people have been putting it on, the feedback has been really positive about you know, what they've been able to, you know, how it's weighted, how it's balanced there. So I'm not as concerned about the fact that it's 10 or 11 pounds fully kitted out. I can always take the battery off and put it on a belt clip. There are plenty of different options you could do to adjust it, but it seems naturally balanced, you know, balanced fairly well. So it, It's kind of in the same ballpark as uh, an Ari Alexa, maybe a little bit lighter because they're about 16 pounds. Yeah, this is definitely so, lighter. And it's, a, it's definitely in the same ballpark as a Red Scarlet. In fact, it may be a little bit more balanced per se because with the Scarlet and the Epics are more square, whereas this is a little bit longer and it just, it would make more sense balanced on your shoulders to have the camera just a little bit longer. Right. So the good thing is you don't got to go out and buy all kinds of accessories from third-party manufacturers to mount this because you guys right. make them out specifically. Right. If they want to, if they want to buy it, and the one thing we do like about this mount that we kind of learned with the Ursa is this has the ability to have that quick-release plate with the shoulder kit. So that's kind of a nice thing to be able to say, I'm at an event, I've got it locked in, I quick release it off, and I put it on my shoulder. So that's just a nice bit for you know, like you said, four hundred dollars is not a lot to be able to get that functionality itself. Yeah, definitely not. I, you can also control some settings on the actual yeah, remote too. So it's got some length based controls here and I think this was going to change a little bit in the final version but just some basic start stops and you know some user assignable controls I believe are part of our game plan down down on this so you know we're going to have to see in the final version what makes the final cut there but uh, it's it's definitely a high functioning camera when you think about the fact that Obviously, this is the PL 4.6K version, which is the most expensive at $5,500. But the yeah. fact that basically the base model is three grand, and you think about even three and a half years ago when we came out with that first cinema camera, 2.5K at three grand, like that was a lot of camera for the money. To think that you can buy a 4K Ursa Mini today for three grand, I mean, we are only outdoing ourselves at this point with our, you know, kind of price performance model. So it's an exciting thing. It's great to come to an event like this and have, you know, a thousand people show up to come talk to us about what we're doing. And, you know, we feel very fortunate that we're able to do what we do to, you know, build these products for customers. I can tell by looking at it, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be great. And like I say in all my YouTube videos, it's going to be a monster of a camera. It, do it doesn't weigh that much at all. Uh, that comes with all the accessories, all the dynamic range you could want. And we're hoping for like you said earlier, cinema camera quality and the ASA. Uh, it, it's, I think it's just going to be a, a great camera. I think it's going to be like one of the hottest cameras ever released. I'm anticipating getting one hopefully to review for you guys. Hopefully you guys have found this review, uh, a quick review, an overview of this camera. It's like a pre-review kind of uh, of the Ursa Mini. And this is specifically is the 4.6K, which I'm sure you're interested in with the PL mount version. So, any last thoughts, Dan, for everybody? Yeah, just happy everyone showed up today. Happy you were able to come by and do an interview. Obviously, we are like, always listening to customer feedback, so uh, don't think we don't listen. We obviously work very hard to create these products. I'd love to get every feature into every product. Uh, obviously, in order to meet some of these price points, we have to make some choices, but obviously we do this more for the customers than anything else, so uh, we do appreciate all the, you know, the feedback that we get and all the support we get from our users as well. Cool. So don't worry, guys. I, Dan's going to make sure I get one before it comes out so I can review it. He promised. Right, Dan? I promise. <laughs> We're hoping. All right. It's great speaking with you, Dan. Thank you so much for the interview. Appreciate it. No problem.